Okay, open your Bibles to the book of Ruth. We, uh, we finally finished up 1 Peter last week, so we are starting another little study. Uh, we're going to be studying the book of Ruth. Uh, my goal is to do a chapter a week, so we'll see how that goes. We'll see if we get, to, uh, get, get through the whole chapter. There's a lot of stuff. Um, I was talking to Rampage one day, and uh, I said, you know, I started on this study, and, and uh, I was looking at it and working through it, and had four pages of notes and realized I'd gotten through the first two verses. And I thought, oh, man, I better scale this back a little bit. So, so there's, a, there's a lot of stuff. I love this book, and uh, I always like to title the studies. And so I was kind of looking at different uh, aspects, and, uh, you know, it, it is a biblical love story. And, uh, but it, it's also a story about redemption. And so I've, I've titled this Redemption's Love Story. And so if we take a look at the book of Ruth. Now, as Pastor Mark has been teaching on Monday mornings about providence, and he's given us uh, a definition, a fantastic definition. But he's smarter than I am, and I've got a smaller definition. And so the definition that I've got uh, that we're going to be looking at in, in uh, reminding, being reminded of uh, throughout this whole study is uh, providence is God's benevolent and wise superintendence of his creation. It's almost like Pastor Mark's, but it's a little shorter and easier for me to remember. So it's God's benevolent and wise superintendence of his creation. So in other words, God's in control. Amen. Yeah. And aren't you grateful for that? Aren't you thankful that he's in control and we are not? Even though at times we feel like we are, even though at times we think we are, and, you know, we can make decisions, but it's God who orders our steps. Amen? And we should pray, and we should seek His direction, and we should seek His will, and we should plan ahead, but ultimately it's God who orders our steps. And He's working all things to the good for them that love Him who are called according to His purpose. Amen? even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it. And so as we take a look at this, uh, this little book, uh, four chapters, there's so much in this book. And uh, we see the hand of God all through this book. And we see, you know, the providence of God. It, it, it's really a book about the providence of God. His benevolent and wise superintendent of his creation. Warren Wiersbe said this. He said, because God gave us freedom of choice, we can ignore the will of God, argue with the will of God, disobey the will of God, even fight against the will of God. But in the end, the will of God shall prevail because the counsel of the Lord stands forever. Psalm 33:11. Amen. Um, Paul said in Ephesians 1, 11, that God works all things according to the counsel of His will. Daniel says this in Daniel 4, 35. He does according to His will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And Job 42, 2 says that no plan of yours, God, can be thwarted. And so we do make decisions and we seek out God's will and we seek to do and we, we, we live our lives. But it's, it's really God that's ordering our steps. Praise God for that. Because he really knows what he's doing. You know, there are many, many times in my life when I thought that I could counsel God. You know, and you think about that. I mean, come on, you've done it too. We think that we can counsel God. We, we think, okay, God, I, I think it would be better this way. It never works out when I take matters into my own hands. God's will will be done. And so as we take a look at this, uh, this little book, um, we're going to be looking at the providence of God. So let's look at the first five verses of chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. 
And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. These first five verses work to set up the whole story. It, it, it sets the stage, if you will, for the whole rest of the story. And so we'll take a look at some lessons from uh, chapter 1 in these first five verses. It, it starts out, it says, In the days when the judges ruled. Now, that was a period in Israel's history that was uh, not a good period in their history. If you flip back a page and you look at the last verse of the book of Judges, it tells you what the book of Judges is all about. The last verse, verse 25, In those days there was no king in Israel, Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's a time in Israel's history that it's a record of division, of cruelty, of apostasy, of civil war, of national disgrace. Wait a minute, that kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? But this was a time in Israel's history that was not good. And the setting that we find this story in the book of Ruth is during that time. And, and, you know, when you think about it, like Israel uh, in the past, many of God's people today are living um, in unbelief and disobedience and are not seeing the blessings of God in their lives. Now, again, this story is set up in those days. And so the time, the days of the judges... And you think about it, this is a beautiful love story, and we're going to see that as it unfolds. And I know, guys, I know, we don't want to hear a love story. We don't want to talk about a love story. We go, ah! Yeah, but it, it really is. You just can't get past that fact that it is a beautiful love story. And, and it seems incredible that this beautiful love story should take place at such a terrible time in Israel's history. But remember, God is ordering the steps, remember? Remember? God, in His wise and benevolent superintendence of His creation, is at the helm, and He's taking care of things. You think about this. When you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, no matter how tough the times get, you are part of a beautiful love story. Amen? No matter what happens in our lives, we are part, if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we know that He is our Savior, He is our Redeemer, and we're going to hear that word a lot. If we know that He is our Redeemer, no matter what happens in this life, we are part of a beautiful love story. And so as we see this love story unfold, we have to remember that this story, and I want you to think about this, this story is a picture of the love story uh, between Christ and His bride, between Christ and the church. So in spite of all that was going on here in this story, God was reaping a harvest and He was producing fruit. And so the time was the time of the judges, the days when the judges ruled. And what was going on? There was a famine in the land. There was a famine in the land, in the land of Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem is the house of bread. Now, and you think, it, you think about this. It's really strange that there's a famine in the house of bread. Now, in the Old Testament, a famine was often um, evidence of God's discipline against His people because His people had sinned against Him. And, and we, see, we read about this in Leviticus uh, chapter 26, and, uh, and all throughout the nation of Israel's history, you know, God disciplines. And in our lives, God disciplines. The writer of Hebrews tells us that He chastises those whom He loves. Praise God for the chastising of the Lord. Amen. You know, he doesn't allow us to go wherever we want to go and do whatever we want to do. And, 
and, and, and turn against him and do nothing about it. He chastises those whom he loves. He treats us as sons and daughters. Praise God for that. And, and so as we see here in this story, in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the, in the land. Now, could this have been the disciplining of the Lord? Probably. We're not told that, but probably. And again, you look at the setting and you look at the time. The time was in the days when the judges ruled. They, they were against God. And, and, you know, in the book of Judges, all throughout the book, God would raise up a judge. He would bring things back into a order. People would come back to worshiping the, the one true God. And everything would be good for a little while. The judge would die and they would go right back to doing what was right in their own eyes and worshiping false gods and doing all of these things that were against God, he would raise up another judge, bring them back, and it would happen over and over and over again. Man, I think we need to pray for whatever's going on with those trucks. Let's just do that. Let's take a moment. Father, once again, we just uh, bow before your throne, God, as we've just seen and heard those two fire trucks um, blaring down the street. God, we ask that you would be in that situation. God, that you would be with, uh, if there's a house on fire or whatever is going on, God, I pray that you would be with uh, the residents of that, uh, of that facility or that house, if, that you would be with the firefighters and the, res the first responders, God, that you would be in that situation, that your hand would be there, and God, that you would keep everyone safe. And Father, we'll be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So again, it's in the time of the judges, and it was a time that Israel repeatedly turned from God. So, so could this famine be the disciplining of the Lord? Probably. Probably. And so not only do we see uh, when it happened and, and what was going on in the setting of the famine, but we, dis we see a, a, a decision that was made here. Um, one author wrote this. He says, when troubles come to our lives, we can do one of three things. He says we can endure it, we can escape it, or we can enlist it. He says if we only endure it, then the trial becomes our master and we have a tendency to become hard and bitter. He says if we try to escape it, then we will probably miss the purposes God wants to achieve in our lives. But he says, if we learn to enlist our trials, they then become our servants instead of our masters. Then we can see that God is working all things according to our good and His glory. And so we need to ask the question, what, in the midst of the trials instead of why? What, Lord? What, what, are you, what are you wanting to teach me? What are you wanting me to learn? What am I supposed to get from this trial instead of, God, why am I going through this trial? Which is where we go to whenever we're going to, through a trial, right? I, I don't understand, Lord. I'm doing everything right and everything's working. Why is this happening? So instead of asking why, we need to start learning how to ask what. Lord, what is it that we are to learn from this trial? Elimelech made a wrong decision. I don't know if you've noticed that. He made a wrong decision when he decided to leave his home. Why? Well, I believe that he, he was walking by sight and not by faith. There was a famine in the land, and the famine was probably due to, you know, the judgment of God falling upon his people. And Elimelech said, I'm getting out of here. Uh, the Sia, I'm leaving. Now, again, according to what it, it says here, that he meant to just go and sojourn in Moab. Now, there's a couple of things that we need to see here. Sojourn means, to, it means a, a temporary residence. Hey, I'm going to go there for a little while. When, when the famine is over, I'll be back. So see you guys. I'll see you when this is all. Call me when it's done, and, and I'll come back. So that's the first thing. He, he meant to just go there and sojourn. Where did he go? He went to Moab. Moab is the enemy of Israel. So he went to the enemy's territory. Uh, you know, we, listen, we, 
especially in the judgment of God, when, when, when God is disciplining his people, you don't want to run to the enemy. We want to stay with the Lord. We want to walk by faith and not by sight and see it through. But it's easy, if you think about it, and we admit it, it's easy to say, like David said in Psalm 55, verse 6. Kevin was, was talking about uh, David's prayer. David said in Psalm 55, verse 6, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. So in other words, I'm getting out of here. If I just had wings, I could just fly away and get away from this problem. But rather, it would be wiser to say like Isaiah in Isaiah 40, 31, right? Those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up as wings on eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. So I don't know if you've ever noticed, but have you ever watched an eagle fly? It's an amazing thing. They, they just soar. They seem to effortlessly soar. They're up there, and what, the, what do they do? They fly above the storm. They're not in the storm. They're not below. They, they just kind of soar above the storm. And that's the picture that Isaiah gives us in Isaiah 40, 30, 31, if we just wait upon the Lord. But Elimelech made the decision to fly like a dove. He made the decision to, to, to run away. Here's the truth. You might not know this. You can't run away from your problems. You know, I was thinking about this as, as I was going through this, and I was thinking about a former client that we had who has now since passed. Um, but he used to say this all the time. He said, no matter where you go, there you are. No matter where you go, there you are. You can't run from your problem because most of the time, we're the problem. And so Elimelech was trying to run from his problem. He was trying to get out from underneath the disciplining hand of the Lord instead of walking by faith. So you think about this. The scripture says that we're to walk by faith and not by sight. So how do we walk by faith? How do we do that? Well, it's easy when you think about it. The Word tells us how to do it by claiming the promises of God and obeying the Word of God. James says that we are to be a doer of the Word and not a hearer only. Amen? You know, if we just listen to the Word of God but say, oh yeah, that's, that's great for you. That's good for Keith, but not for me. You know what? It, it sounds good, but I think I got a better way. That's foolish. That's foolish. We walk by faith by doing what the Word of God says and trusting Him. It means, I used to have, when, when I originally was writing these notes, I had, it means committing yourself to the Lord, but I've since changed that. Rampage changed my mind on that. It means surrendering yourself to the Lord. There's a difference, in, and he'll talk about that, and I'll leave that to him. But it means surrendering. It means giving up. It means, okay, Lord, whatever you say. And you think about what that means. Whatever you say. Now, you know, I was thinking about that, and I was thinking way back when I surrendered to, to preach. And I was thinking about how the Lord um, laid on my heart that he was calling me into the ministry, and you know, I'm like, no, no way. Lord, you've got to be kidding me. I've got to be your first mistake. No, you were talking to somebody else, not me, and I'm trying to run. And I remember the day, and it's coming up, my anniversary is October 12th, 1997, is when I surrendered to preach. And it was in the midst of a very uh, difficult and traumatic time. My mom was, was dying of colon cancer, and all of these things, and we were taking care of her, and it was a very difficult, very difficult time in my life. And I remember the day, I'll never forget it, for the rest of my life, I surrendered. I ended up on my knees, and, and uh, the pastor that had come to, to, to preach that morning, he said, in his southern twang, how can I pray with you? I said, God, it's, it's, he's, he's calling me, and I'm... I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm done running. I was scared to death. 
not knowing what was going to happen. Now, back, let me back up a little bit prior to this. Probably six months or so prior to this surrendering, I had, and that, at that very same spot, I had knelt down and prayed a prayer like this, Lord, I, I want to just serve you. I just want to do whatever it is you want me to do, not knowing what it was that he was going to call me to do. Lord, I just, I just want to serve you. I just want to, whatever it is. And I'm glad at that moment that he didn't say, okay, good, go preach. Because I would have said, no, absolutely not. Well, I did say that eventually, you know. I surrendered. Not knowing and not understanding what really that meant. But when that came to fruition, it scared the daylights out of me. No way, Lord. We walk by faith, by surrendering, by trusting Him, knowing that He's working all things for the good for them that love Him who are called according to His purpose. We trust Him. Now, what happens in this story? Well, Elimelech goes... He takes his family, his wife, his two sons. They are, they're planning to just sojourn to visit Moab until the problems are over with back in Bethlehem. And Elimelech dies. I hate it when our plans don't work out, right? Elimelech dies. And so now Naomi is left there as a widow with her two sons. And then it gets worse. Verse 4. They, the two sons, took Moabite wives. Wait a minute. These were the enemies. So they married into the enemy's camp. They took Moabite wives, Orpah and Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. Now, you know, it's thought that this 10-year span of time is probably the whole time that they were there from the time that they left Bethlehem until all of this had happened. They lived there 10 years, and then it gets worse. Malon and Chilion both died. Now, again, we're not told how Elimelech, we're not told how uh, Malon and Chilion, we're not told how they die. We're not told if they're, this was the disciplining of the Lord. We're, not, we're just not told. And so we don't know. But the fact is that all three, the husband and the two sons, have passed away now and they're gone. And these women are left now on their own. But the, verse 5, the woman, Naomi, was left without her two sons and her husband. And so this sets up the next section. We'll, we'll get through hopefully the next section. Three people, three decisions. So let's look at verses 6 through 18. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that I may that may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, to, for, me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept, and again Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, 
Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when, when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. I don't know if we'll be able to unpack all of it. There's a lot of stuff in that. But we'll get started with it at least. Three people, three decisions. Think about it now. Four people left Bethlehem. Elimelech, Naomi, Malon, and Chilion. Three of the four died. Now Naomi survived, verse 5 tells us. Her two, husband, or her two sons and her husband. So decision number one. Naomi, in verse 6, she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return. And so she had heard. The, the, the word came down the pike that, hey, there's, there's food back in, in Bethlehem again. So Naomi says, I got to go back. I got to go back. And so she made the decision to return. This is a key word here in this chapter. We see the word return mentioned 12 times in this chapter. It's mentioned in verse 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, and 15. To return. Think about this. Whenever we have disobeyed the Lord, what do we need to do? We need to repent. Whenever we have disobeyed the Lord and departed from His will, we must confess our sin and return to the place of blessing. Return back. We need to repent. Repent means to turn around. It need, it's a change of mind. It's a change of direction. We repent of our sin, confess it to the Lord, and turn back to Him and turn away from the sin. Isaiah 55 verse 7 says this, Let the wicked forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Naomi made the decision to return. Is this repentance? I don't know. But she made the decision to turn back and to go back to Bethlehem. And her two daughters-in-law stood up, and they said, We're going to go with you. They start off with Naomi, but she stopped them, and urged them not to go with her, rather stay here. Return back to your family. Return and remarry. So in other words, what she was telling these girls, go back and, and remarry and have families, live your lives. Listen, I'm too old to have, I don't have other sons. I'm too old to have other children. Even if I did have a child in the womb. Are you going to wait till they grow up? to Listen, go back. Go back home. Live your lives. And she even prayed for them in verses 8 and 9, that the Lord would be kind to them and that the Lord would give them new husbands and that the Lord would give them rest after all of their sorrows. Three times, Naomi told the girls to return home. She told them in verse 11, or 8, verse 11, and verse 12. She was returning back to her homeland, and she told the girls to go back to their families and start their lives over. Decision number one, Naomi made the decision to go back. Decision number two, verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So in this verse, now um, Orpah has a small part in this story. She's mentioned um, a couple of times in this story. Orpah started to go with Naomi. She kissed her and she wept with her, yet she did not stay with her. She took Naomi's advice and she went back home. She left the scene. Think about this. Orpah here in verse 14, she leaves the scene and she's never mentioned again for the rest of Scripture. We never hear of her again. She's, she's one of those characters, if you will, in the scriptures that have, have a small part, a part nonetheless, but she has a small part 
And then she leaves the scene and she's never heard from again in the scripture. So decision number two, Orpah, stay, or Orpah stays and returns back home. Decision number three, verse 14, the last part of verse 14, but Ruth clung to her. The word clung in the Hebrew is an expression of loyalty and devotion. Now remember, returning not only to her people meant returning to her people's gods. And uh, Kamash was one of, the, one of the main gods. They, they served, the Moabites worshipped false gods, many false gods, and Kamash was one of the, the main gods that they worshipped. And uh, this god required uh, child sacrifice. Horrible stuff. We can read about this in Numbers 21 and 1 Kings 11 and Jeremiah 48. It required, and again, this is what they have imposed because this is a false god, human sacrifice, and specifically child sacrifice. And so what Naomi was telling Ruth was to go back to your people and go back and serve this false god. Not good advice. But Ruth said no. And in, in verses 16 and 17, I think, are some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture. You think about this. Her, her statement is one of the most magnificent confessions found anywhere in Scripture. First, she, she confessed her love for Naomi and her desire to stay with her mother-in-law. Again, her, her, her love for her, her commitment to her, even to death. Then she confessed her faith in the one true and living God and her decision to worship Him alone. Your God will be my God. She made a decision for the one true God. She was willing to forsake father and mother and her family in order to cleave to Naomi and, the, and to the God of Naomi's people. Ruth was steadfastly determined to accompany Naomi and live in Bethlehem with God's covenant people. Some of the most beautiful, let me, let me read that again, verses 16 and 17. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. What was Naomi's decision? She shut up. She shut up. She just stopped at that point. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. She said no more. She stopped speaking there. Let's... Let's quickly go through the rest of this chapter. Verse 19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And here's a key verse. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. And so they get back into town, back into Bethlehem. Now, now this was uh, about a 60 to 75 mile trip. It probably took seven to ten days. Now, you know, uh, verse 18, when she saw that Ruth wasn't going wasn't gonna to hear her and she was determined to go, she shut up. That doesn't mean that they kept silent for the whole trip, I don't think. No offense, ladies. <laughs> seven to ten days without talking, that's nah, not going to happen. Men, I mean, seven to ten days without talking, not going to happen. And, and, you know, I thought about this as they were traveling this 60 to 75 miles. What did they talk about? What was the conversation like on the way back? Did they, you know, did Naomi give Ruth 
the Moabites some instructions on the law of Moses? Did, did Ruth ask questions of, uh, about uh, you know, the Jewish faith? Uh, did they talk about their new home in Bethlehem and what to expect? What? We're not told, so we don't know. But that's where my mind goes. What did they talk about? What was the conversation like? And then they get back into town. Now, remember, Naomi had been gone 10 years. And they get back into town, and the women of the towns, oh, they, they were excited. Is this Naomi? Now, Naomi's name means pleasant. But here in this picture here, she was anything but pleasant. She said, don't call me Naomi. And then she blames God, right? For the Lord has dealt very bitterly with me. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. So she went from... Instead of turning uh, and letting the trials uh, make her better, they made her bitter. These ten difficult years and all the sorrows that she encountered had, had taken their toll on her appearance and on her personality. And I'll end with this. A Chuck Swindoll quote. And Chuck Swindoll uh, I, uh, I quote this, the last part of it. He has this whole section on attitude. And he talks about attitude is key for everything. And he says this, and I probably should pay him royalties because I've said this many, many times. He said, I believe that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. So in other words, we can take something big and in the eyes of the Lord and in our faith and trusting Him and make it small because we're trusting in the Lord with all of our heart and we're not leaning on our own understanding, right? But what we do most of the time is we take something small and we make it gigantic. He said life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. How do we react to the things in life. I wish I could sit up here and say, man, I've done everything right. Every time I've pat, no way, no way. I'm learning. Let's learn together as we go through the, the trials and the crucibles of life, knowing that God is in control, amen? Let's pray. Our Father, once again, we just uh, bow before your throne. God, as we begin this magnificent love story as we see your hand in the midst of all of the things that are happening. God, help us to glean from this story the truths that you would have us to learn and to know um, in our own personal lives and in the ministry that you've called us to. May you have your will and your way, and Father, we'll be sure to give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.